Please take your copy of God's uh -huh. Word and turn with me to Mark chapter 7, continuing our study of Mark chapter 7. And today we're looking at verses 24 through 30. If you remember the last two sections that we looked at here in chapter 7 addressed uncleanness. And now in this section that we're going to look at today, it shows Jesus withdrawing to a, re a region that the Jews considered to be notoriously unclean. Now I'm reading Mark 7, verses 24 to 30, and I'm going to read the parallel passage with it, which is Matthew 15, 21 to 28. I'm going to read them both together in the book One Perfect Life that we just read from. It says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it. But he could not be hidden. For behold, a woman of Cana, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard about him. And she came from that region and fell at his feet and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter, and her daughter was healed from that very hour. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out, and her daughter lying on the bed. <clears throat> the only way to please Jesus is by faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Many people believe in Jesus for the wrong reasons. The Apostle John said in chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, that when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, there were many that believed in his name. They were observing his signs, which he was doing. But it also tells us here that Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. He knew if they had genuine, saving faith. They didn't believe. With that kind of faith, they believed because of the signs that they were seeing him do. And so Jesus did not commit himself to them. But on the other hand, there are those who believe in a saving way. And Mark demonstrated that to us already in several places in his gospel. For example, in chapter 2, we saw a group of men who brought a paralytic to Jesus. You remember they came and since the crowd was so great and they couldn't get in through the door, they started cutting a hole through the roof. You remember that? Well, they had great faith. They believed that their friend could be healed by Jesus and obviously he believed the same thing. But you know what? Not only did Jesus heal him physically, but he healed him spiritually. Do you remember what he said? He told him, your sins are forgiven. That was the greatest need that he had. Yes, his physical need was great, but his greater need was spiritual. Over in chapter 5, there was a woman who had a hemorrhage, and she also demonstrated saving faith. 
when she had reached out and touched Jesus' garment, she believed that she would be healed. But when she was called out into the crowd, she did not hide. She came very reverently to Jesus and told everything that she had done. In fact, it says in Mark 5.33 that she told him the whole truth. And you know what Jesus said? Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Another person that's also in the same story was Jairus. You remember him? Synagogue leader. He came to witness with his wife, Jesus raised his daughter from the dead. And right before that happened, when the people came and told him, don't trouble the teacher any longer, she's dead, and he heard that, Jesus said to him, do not be afraid, only believe. And that's exactly what he did. These were Gentile people. And just like in our story here in chapter 7, this is a story about a Gentile woman. And it's also a story that gives us a great example of true saving faith. In fact, Matthew calls it great faith. Our story picks up after Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees and the scribes concerning unwashed hands. You remember that? That was one of the traditions of the elders that they were to observe. And, of course, Jesus did not honor that tradition, and nor did his disciples. If you remember these traditions, they had were basically fence laws that they put around the law of God. And maybe the motive in the beginning was noble, but the problem was is that those traditions became just as binding as Scripture. And so Jesus rebuked them for their man-made traditions and for their neglect of the Word of God. And so after his explanation about what is clean and what is unclean? Where is that true source of uncleanness coming from? He now leaves that area. He withdraws. And he withdraws into a Gentile territory. Just like I said a few moments ago, the whole text right before that was speaking about what was unclean, and now Jesus goes into an area that the Jews considered to be unclean. And this is really giving us a future picture because the gospel was to go into that area. And so Mark says, if you look at verse 24, Jesus got up, went away from there to the region of Tyre. Now, Tyre was situated on the northwest of Galilee. This was a Gentile territory of ancient Phoenicia. Today it is southern Lebanon. Matthew referred to it as the district of Tyre and Sidon. Both were coastal cities that were about 20 miles apart. They were on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. It was also from that region that Jezebel had come and tormented the prophet Elijah. By the first century, like all of Israel, Tyre and Sidon were under Roman rule. And here was really the understanding of Tyre and Sidon that was given by the rabbis. They actually believed that, that that area right there had committed gross paganism, gross idolatry, and therefore it was unclean. Well, that was true. They were known for their paganism. They were known for their worship of the fertility goddess that is known in the Old Testament as Ashtaroth. If you remember, the children of Israel worshipped that false pagan god, and God judged them for that. Now, according to Mark 7.31, after spending an unspecified period of time in this region, Jesus journeyed through Sidon before traveling east and then south along the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. In the face of his own people's rejection, he sought rest seclusion in this Gentile place. And even though he sought the rest, it was a time for instruction for his disciples. 
And it also was where a divine appointment was waiting him. Mark says that after they arrived, they entered a house. Neither Matthew nor Mark tell us who this house belonged to. Either way, he didn't want anybody to know about it. So this was a private withdrawal. This was a private tour. And if they were in Gennesaret, this was about 60 miles on foot. Take about a full day's journey, but it could be done. But this was a long, private tour into that region. And even though that he didn't want anybody to know about him being there once he entered the house, it says in the text that he could not escape notice. Even deep in Gentile territory, with roughly 35 miles northwest of Capernaum, the people heard about him. Going back to Mark 3 and verse 8, people from the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon had been among the crowds that followed during his Galilean ministry. After he had healed a man in the synagogue with a withered hand, remember that in Mark 3? He withdrew to the sea with his disciples. And then verse 7 says this, A great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Indumea, and beyond the Jordan, and notice this, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. They undoubtedly returned home with first-hand reports of the amazing miracles that he had performed. And as a result, word about him had spread far beyond the borders of Israel. And so after hearing that he was staying nearby, Mark says a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now, if you have children or grandchildren, you hurt with them when they are hurting, right? And you never get over that. No matter what age they are, you hurt with them when they hurt. This is what Teresa and I feel each and every day with our son Samuel and the struggles that he has. We were up this morning for a long time, uh, kind of operating on a couple hours of sleep. So if I veer off into something that I'm talking about has nothing related to it, just wait with me. I'll be back, hopefully. But it gets to be tough, and we had really pretty much a tough week. And so I can relate here, not that my son is demon-possessed. Some would think he would be. In fact, even the question comes up, do all kids who have seizures, does that mean that they're demon-possessed? Well, we know why he has seizures. He was injured at birth. That's what has caused his problems. So here it says that she came to Jesus. What's the best place to go when you have a problem? To Jesus, right? I tell you what, that's what we do. And I tell you, I've been praying all night for my son and praying that God would just help him and make him go to sleep so I could go to sleep and my wife could go to sleep. But she came to Jesus and Notice how she came. She came in humble reverence. It says there that she fell down before Jesus. That's the right way to come. That's recognizing who he is. That's recognizing his sovereign authority. That's recognizing that he is the God of all creation. And he is the one who could heal her daughter. Other people came the same way. Over in Mark 1.40, a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him. And it says in the text that, And falling on his knees before him said, If you are willing, you can make me clean. He knew Jesus could heal. He had heard all about Jesus, probably even witnessed some of it, seeing him heal other people. And he probably thought, maybe he would heal me. And so he comes to Jesus, and in reverence and humility, he falls down before him. In chapter 5, when we were talking about Jairus just a moment ago, uh, he came the same way. It says in Mark 5, 22, one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. So that's the only way to come with reverence, with humility. 
Now in verse 26, we find some more information about this woman. She was a Gentile. New King James Version says she was Greek. And basically when you see that, when it says someone's a Gentile, it just basically means that they're not Jews. They're non-Jews. So that would pick up all the other people groups. So basically the Bible looks at it this way. You're either Jew or Gentile. We're Gentiles. And we ought to be extremely thankful for this story that we're reading right here because we're seeing Jesus reach out and say, listen, the gospel needs to go to all the nations. And it did. Praise the Lord. That's how we've heard of it. It, it, it come to us too. And we've heard the gospel and we have responded with saving faith. But you know, the Jews had a a really bad view of Gentiles. Now, as I talk about how they felt about Gentiles, if we were living at this time, this would be how that they would be talking about us. In fact, there are probably Jews today that still carry some of these views. They viewed the Gentiles with a sense of exclusion and disdain. They considered them outside the sway of the rabbis and the true people of God. The Apostle Paul he referenced the Gentiles in Ephesians 2.11 when he said, Therefore remember that formerly you, here he's talking about their past, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, and having no hope and without God in the world. That's what Paul said about the Gentiles, what they were like before Christ. And frankly, folks, that could be said of every person outside of Christ. Take even, for example, the Samaritans. The Jews were not at all favorable of the Samaritans. They were a mixed race of Jews. They viewed, were viewed with contempt. They were seen as their bitter enemies. They believed that the Samaritans had desecrated the temple. In John 4, 9, we're told that the Samaritan woman that was there speaking with Jesus said, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan? And then John puts in parentheses, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This highlights the deep-seated amosity that lacked interaction between both of those groups. And now according to Mark 7, 27, look how the Jews referred to them. Look at verse 27. What did they call the Gentiles? Dogs. And we'll say more about that in just a minute. But it also tells us here in verse 26 that this woman was from the Syrophoenician race, that Adjective Syrophoenician, it describes the people in that area during that time. As I said a moment ago, that Phoenicia had been, really was a part of Syria, and it, and it had been brought under Syrian control by the Roman general Pompey about 65 B.C. Mark gives us another bit of information about this woman, and even Matthew throws in some for us too, like that she was a Canaanite. And if you remember anything about the Canaanites, they were the ancient enemies of Israel. So think about this for a moment. She had everything against her. First, she was a woman. That would be against her, which would mean that she was viewed as inferior. Second, she was a Gentile. Third, she was a Canaanite. But you know what? She accepted all that. And I think that's the story behind the story. How do you view yourself? How did you view yourself when you came to Jesus? Did you come the way Scripture painted you? Did you view yourself the same way Scripture viewed you? As a sinner under the wrath of God? Well, it says in verse 26, She came to Jesus and she kept asking Him to cast the demon out. She kept doing it. She was persistent. Matthew says when she came to him, she began to cry out. 
saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Now we find here in the verse, son of David, and calling him Lord, she knew more about him than we realize. We've said this on other occasions, that when we share the gospel, we need to present to the people that we're talking to who Jesus is. Not just calling them to be saved, not calling them to repent. We need to tell them who Jesus is and why they need to come to him in repentance and saving faith. Well, just to cut it short, Jesus grants her request. But let's look at all the things that went around this. Before he does this, notice his response Matthew 15, 23 gives us his first response. It says that after her plea for mercy for her daughter, he did not answer her a word. He didn't say anything. You say, why did he do that? I mean, even his disciples were probably dumbfounded by that because they even went to Jesus and said, send her away. She keeps shouting at us. Their response was insensitive. Their response was prejudiced over how they viewed Gentiles. They didn't want to be bothered by this Gentile woman who was interfering with their plans and peace of mind. The early church father Chrysostom said, The word has no word. The fountain is sealed. The physician holds back his remedy. But Jesus did nothing unloving. He didn't do anything without a divine purpose. There's a reason why he was silent. And here it is. He was testing her. He was testing her faith. He put up barriers not to keep her away, but to draw her closer to himself. He also used the occasion to show his disciples the value of persistent faith. And he also sought to help them to distinguish between what is genuine and what is superficial. He erected barriers that only genuine, persistent faith could hurdle. His second response is also recorded in Matthew. It's in verse 24. First response, silence. He didn't say anything. Second response, when he did say something, this is what he said. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was his focus. When he came, his purpose was, was to go to his people. He came to save his people from their sins. He didn't come to the Gentiles. He came to the Jews. And you know what? The Jews were also to be the catalyst later to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. But they didn't do that, did they? But his ministry was primarily directed toward Jewish people. That doesn't mean that he didn't minister at times to Gentiles. I read to you a moment ago where he did. But Israel was God's chosen people. And they still are. They had spiritually wandered from God like sheep. He was sent to seek and save the lost. According to Romans 11, God's ultimate plan was to use Israel to be a light to the Gentiles. Now, even though he had already healed a Roman centurion, he offered the water of life to the Samaritan woman. The disciples probably didn't understand why he was silent toward this Gentile woman other than the fact that she was Gentile and Jews had no dealings with Gentiles. But Jesus shattered that claim. And he later even commissioned his disciples to take the gospel where? To all the nations. That's what we're to do. We're not to be prejudiced. We're not to be partial. We're not to be those who, in the fad that came some years ago about target ministry, if you remember that, Rick Warren was very popular in his book, The Purpose Driven Church, of targeting people that you want to reach in your church. The problem is, is that doing target ministry like that is that there are many people that are not targeted and left behind. And they're not given the gospel. Our target is everyone, not some. 
Well, again, Matthew 15, 25 says she came, she began to bow down before him, and she pleaded and asked the Lord to help her. She persisted through his silence and through his statement about his primary focus on the Jews. He, then Jesus had a third response. Third response is here in verse 27 of Mark. And he says, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, the children would be a reference to Israel. The bread would be a reference to the blessings that were given to Israel. Now, the term dogs, well, that's not a good term. Reference to the Gentiles. Common Jewish term of abuse and contempt. You know, Scripture even uses it for reproach. Do you remember when David was fighting the Philistine? Do you remember what the Philistine said to David when he first went out into the field to fight him? 1 Samuel 17, 43. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? See, it was a term of reproach. But Jesus' use of the term does not mean that he approved of it or accepted it as accurate. In fact, his purpose apparently was to test the woman to see if she would be willing to accept that lowly position that was assigned to her. Now, there were two terms for dogs. One referred to the mangy, often vicious mongrels that ran in packs. They lived off the garbage and the carcasses of dead animals. They didn't have any owners, so they just roamed. We get some of them, right? People, we call them strays. The other term that's used is referring to household pets that were sometimes treated like the family. Some of you all have pets in your home, and you treat them sometimes better than you do your children. <laughs> and that's the term he's using here. Jesus softened the force of the expression with the use of the diminutive little dogs. And even though that he used the term, it was far from a compliment. The woman knew that children referred to Jews, and she knew that dogs referred to Gentiles, and both were used by the Jews. But his words sounded much like the insult the Jews had frequently cast at the Gentiles. So she heard it many times, but she wasn't moved. She responded with understanding. She joined him in the analogy. Look at what she says in verse 28. She answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And by that statement, she was recognizing her unworthiness and she acknowledged her place as a Gentile. She readily agreed to the humble position that was assigned to her. She accepted his word and used it to press her plea. Her reply showed not a quick wit, but a deep faith in his generosity. See, her response was unlike many of the Jews who had responded with self-righteous pride. Her attitude was meek. It was poor in spirit. For her, it was just the crumbs. The crumbs were sufficient. A tiny fragment of Jesus' power could heal her, could heal her daughter. And that's all she was seeking for. And though the priority of Jesus' earthly ministry was to the children of Israel, the crumbs of the gospel did fall far from the table to satisfy humble Gentiles who hungered for true righteousness. The covenants, the scriptures, the Messiah... All that may have been given to Israel, but God intended for the Gentiles to receive the overflow. So the message of salvation, it first came to the Jews, and that was the same gospel message that was and would be given to the Gentiles. And as we've already seen, the several Gentile conversions were previews of future salvation of souls from all the nations. 
Well, Jesus had a response to her response to the analogy, and Matthew records that. Mark doesn't record it. But Matthew 15, 28 says that he revealed that she had great faith. The greatness of her faith magnified would compare to the little that she knew. She was born and raised in a pagan culture. She did not share in the privileged heritage of the Jewish people. She was removed from the temple, the sacrificial system, and even the scriptures. And yet, even though she had little revelation, she believed. And the magnitude of her faith was evidenced by her willingness to turn from the pagan deities of her upbringing and embrace Jesus Christ in faith. That's really a stark contrast to the Jewish leaders who arrogantly condemned their own Messiah as a blasphemer and a friend of sinners and an ally of Satan. And so because of her answer, Jesus heals her daughter. Look at what he tells her. Because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. See, Jesus knew she possessed true belief in him. So the process of her being tested, it only strengthened it. Her resolve did not waver, it only intensified. And Jesus was pleased with her answer and he granted her request. Look at verse 30. After arriving home, what does she discover? Her daughter was healed. The demon was gone. Verse 30 says, In going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon having left. And the idea of her lying on the bed indicates that she was lying there out of exhaustion as she wrestled with this demon, but now she was at peace because Jesus had healed her. Now, the daughter's healing is not the primary point of the story. The primary point is the woman's faith that was characterized by humility and penitence and reverence and persistence. And it's focused on the object of her faith. Who was the object of her faith? The Lord Jesus Christ. Genuine faith is persistent, is humble, is penitent. It forsakes everything. In her case, she forsook her idols, she forsook her pride, and reverently and persistently begged for divine mercy and grace. And that's what true faith does. It persists, it endures until it receives the grace that it seeks. So I have a question for you this morning. Does that describe your faith? Have you forsaken all to follow Jesus? See, that's what it really is. See, there, there, there are preachers out there and there are other believers out there that are saying, listen, all you need to do is believe. Believe some facts about Jesus and you'll be saved. Uh, others come back and say, well, yeah, you need to believe, but you need to walk an aisle. Or others say, no, you need to be baptized. And they throw in baptismal regeneration into the mix. You do need to believe. But in that belief, you are forsaking everything to have Jesus, to have his forgiveness. In fact, it says that you believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. So if that's the case, then you have to come to the place of acknowledging that you are a sinner that needs a Savior. You need to be forgiven of all your sin. That's why I, when I think back, when the brother that shared with me the gospel the first thing he said was Steve you need to be forgiven of all your sins and then he pointed me to Jesus and that was true and that's true when we give out the gospel we need to tell people you need to be forgiven of all your sin and the only place that's going to happen is when you come to Jesus and you drop all your baggage and you say I'm willing to forsake everything to have him and to have his forgiveness Scripture says it this way, Matthew 16, 24, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
Even Luke 14, 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, you have to forsake everything and everyone. So does this describe you? Does this describe what you did in coming to Jesus? Or do you have one hand on Jesus and the other hand on the world? Jesus does not accept that. So this morning I urge you to examine yourself, examine how you came. Did you come through the straight and narrow gate? Or did you enter through the wide gate that leads to destruction? Have you turned from your sin? And are you continually turning from your sin and trusting Christ for His forgiveness? Because if not, you have no saving faith that you need to be saved. You examine yourself now as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we just come to you and we hear those words from Jesus' lips that we must deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow you. And we have to be willing to hate our own father and mother, wife and children and brothers and sisters and our own life in order to be your true disciple. And you even tell us in another place that if we continue in your word, you are truly my disciples indeed. So Lord Jesus, I pray, cause every person in here this morning to examine themselves. Have they forsaken all to have all of Christ? And if they haven't, I pray right now that they would cry out in the same way this woman cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. A sinner. Same prayer that the publican had when he came into the temple. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We ask all these things this morning, Lord Jesus. We can't save ourselves. Only you can. And so, Lord, save those, Lord, that need to be saved this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name.